When I rise, I will rise like a bird joyfully. And when I fall, I will fall like a leaf gracefully. When I rise, I will rise like a bird so joyfully. And when I fall, I will fall like a leaf so gracefully. Good morning. Do not fail to be surprised by the catching of your breath, the quickening of your heart, the fullness of your eyes wide and suddenly awake with awe. Here is a place filled with wonder that still might be something new born today. that we might be born anew today. Do not fail to notice the changing, the life full and abundant already beginning by our coming together, already possible by the promises we make to give, to receive, to become more together and to forgive again and again the falling short that is always already here. Here we find ourselves among the courageous feeling ourselves trying to become brave with each in and out of breath, each word, each pause, each song. We give thanks to be on this journey. Come, let us worship together. Good morning. My name is Larry Hawley. I'm a member of your board of trustees. My pronouns are he and his. I'd like to welcome everyone. Welcome young and old. December's an exciting time. Welcome um, in person and online. Although it's cold out, we hope to warm your spirits. And welcome, um, of course, I'm missing a line. But I do want to welcome the left-sitting sanctuary people who obviously enjoy the normal exquisite piano and the right-sitting sanctuary people, which is where I sit, I don't know why. And of course, together, the middle brings us all together. So welcome one and all. Reverend Julie has tested positive for COVID and will not be with us today. So I will be taking on a part of her role in today's service. And Dave Cicero will also speak in Julie's place. We actually have other staff members and congregants who tested positive after last week's music service. So for today, out of an abundance of caution, we are canceling the coffee part of social hour after the service. And notice I said social hour. We can still be social with our highly encouraged masks on. I also request that you speak with someone you do not know during the first part of social hour. Now I'd like to highlight a couple of announcements. Here's what's happening in December. The UU Circle at Harwood Place is December 22nd at 10.30 a.m. Please contest, contact Jude Christensen at the email listed in your announcements. The next board meeting is also December 22nd. And you all should know that you're welcome, whether in person or via Zoom. And you can check next week's e-news to get the Zoom link. Winter solstice solstice ritual is Wednesday, December 21st at 7 p.m. Our Earth Spirit team will help us celebrate the changing of the seasons. On Christmas Eve, we will have one service at 4 p.m. with carols old and new. And this year, there is also a Christmas morning gathering at 10 a.m., It's not quite a service. There will be a special visit from a red-suited special someone 
but this will, the gathering will not be offered online and there'll be no nursery or RE classes. Now we will light our chalice. Thank you. Uh, please join me in reading the words for lighting the chalice. Look, friends, to the sky, to the stars that dance like fireworks overhead, this tiny globe on which we travel. Look to the horizon, the tree line, the expanse of wide open fields, to this living, breathing earth that makes our living and breathing possible. Look at the faces that surround you and notice what a wonder it is that we don't have to walk this world alone. All of it is a miracle. All of it deserves our awe. May this light we now kindle and this time we share illuminate the astonishing preciousness of it all. And now please join me in singing Gather the Spirit. Rise as you're willing and able, in body or in spirit. to join this church is an important one, for it indicates our desire to make a change in how we lead our lives. It means we are members of a community that dreams together and works together, laughs together and learns together. In community, 
We welcome babies into the world, and when someone dies, our grief is shared too. At the heart are the relationships we create with one another, relationships dedicated to building beloved community. Therefore, it is with great joy that we recognize our relationships with the newest members of our church community. So new members, please come forward as I call your names. Brenda Gursky with her daughters, Addie and Violet. Just come and join Larry and I up here so the camera can get you. Teresa Rupsch, where's Teresa, there she is. Dennis Murray. Barb Holzhauer, there's Barb, and Molly Conrad. When you join this church, you become part of a liberal religious community that believes in accepting differences with love. You become part of a community that believes it's important to step out and stand up for the values of religious freedom and justice. You become part of a community that believes our relationships with one another are a primary source of spiritual growth and intellectual delight. And by bringing your gifts and your presence here, you help keep liberal religion fresh and alive. Our church and its activities are open to everyone, but when you join officially, you gain precious and important rights. You gain the right to vote on our congregation's most critical decisions a voice in shaping our future, and the authority to be a leader here. And your choice to become a member has an impact on every member here, reminding them of their own decision however long ago to be a member of UUCW. In this ceremony, each member recommits themselves to the work of this church. And we encourage all of our members to do a number of things to participate regularly in congregational life, to develop their spirituality and deepen their understanding of the Unitarian Universalist tradition, to support the church with their gifts and skills and financial resources, and to allow the church to support them as they move through their life's journey. We also invite our members to bring their ideas and energy to the table, for each new person brings us so much to our shared ministry. The gifts of your minds and spirits will help keep this community flexible and strong. The beauty of your hearts and your compassion will help us grow in diversity and grace. And your knowledge and support will help us rise to the challenges of our changing world. We are so glad that you are with us. And now I'd like to invite all our members, including our new members, to rise in body or spirit and speak together our church mission statement, which is found in your order of service. Unitarian Universalist Church West is a congregation of adults, youth, and children, diverse in identity and beliefs. We strive for honest, caring relationships that inspire and enable spiritual and ethical growth. We promote religious freedom and engage in a shared search for personal and collective meaning. We serve our larger world by practicing compassion and working for justice. And now will those members present today please read with me the words printed in your order of service welcoming our newest members. We welcome you to membership in Unitarian Universalist Church West. Our lives are made richer because you are here. May you find comfort and challenge in this community and help us to grow in harmony and understanding. May you learn and grow here and help us to nurture compassion and action. May you find here deep friendship and take joy in the great work of the Unitarian Universalist community. Welcome. You, uh, congregation, may be seated. <laughs> Anne and I will now extend the right hand of fellowship to each of our new members. And as we do so, Anne will, will hand them things. <laughs> and we, we have, we have a, a card from Reverend Julie and a gift and a membership card for each one of them. Brenda, 
again, welcome. Brenda and family, welcome. Thank you, everyone, and welcome. Please speak with them at social hour. <laughs> At this time, the children and youth that are still here in the, in the sanctuary with us are welcome to join the religious education classes downstairs, and we will sing our children's recessional as they do so. As you go, may joy surround you. As you go, go in peace. Know our love is with you always. As you go, as you go, as you go, may joy surround you. As you go, go in peace. Know our love is with you always. As you go, as you go. Now that the excitement has passed, <laughs> uh, give yourself a moment to kind of get settled in your chair. The meditation this morning is entitled Winter Weather Meditation uh, by the Reverend John Lou Johnston. Winter weather can be seen as gift or curse. The curse is easy to see. Ruined plans, icy falls, fender benders, cabin fever. The gift may be harder to find. There are new kinds of beauty before us. The still, clear starkness of a winter blanket. The glisten of icy crystals. There is wonder before us. Our everyday landscape transformed. And what about the wonder of snowstorms that cancel everything from meetings to school to work, allowing time to extend and reminding us of the gift of time with no particular expectations or assignments. With no place to go, and no one to see. A time for dreaming, perhaps, or music, or reading, or silence. A time for reconnecting with precious people we live with, and sometimes drift away from in the clatter of normal routine. Time may be the most special gift we have in these days, if we are ready to make something of it. The words of David Rankin, there must be a time when we create, we cease speaking to be fully present with ourselves. There must be a time when we exclude clamor by listening to nothing whatsoever. There must be a time when we forego our plans as if we had no plans at all. There must be a time when we abandon conceits and tap into a deeper wisdom. There must be a time when we stop striving and find the peace within. May this wonder of altered time come as a blessing to us all. Amen.
Good morning. This is an excerpt out of a book by Monica Parker, due out in February of next year. The title is The Power of Wonder. Like a type of emotional DNA, wonder spirals its way through our shared human experience, imprinting itself on our lives. From artistic expression to religious faith, from the sound of music in a darkened music hall to the charismatic timber of a great leader, from the sunrise over the Grand Tetons to an electrical storm out the window of an airplane, from the birth of a child or a new idea to the end of a life or a feverish nightmare, wonder exists universally. Gently peeking its head around mental corners or bombastically announcing its arrival into our trembling psyches, wonder changes our perspective, our bodies, our souls, and our lives. Art, music, religion, politics, science, nature, love, fear, birth, death, each of the myriad experiences that compressed to form the bedrock of human life has a golden vein of wonder running through it. Such a primal and primary element of our collective consciousness is ancient and well-documented, yet has only recently been defined and researched by the scientific community. Now please rise in body and or spirit for him 323 Break not the circle. you wonder. That's a wide open question. I remember much younger learning about how the body is made up of molecules. We're not really connected as we see ourselves right now. We're actually kind of floating around, but it's all together. Um, and while I was thinking of that, I came across a reading by one of my favorites, um, that's Thich Nhat Hanh. It's from his book, Peace is Every Step. And he refers to it as interbeing. If you are a poet, you will see clearly that there is a cloud floating in this sheet of paper. Without a cloud, there will be no rain, Without rain, the trees cannot grow, and without trees, we cannot make paper. The cloud is essential for the paper to exist. If the cloud is not here, the sheet of paper cannot be here either. 
So we can say that the cloud and the paper inter are. Interbeing is a word that is not in the dictionary yet. But if we combine the prefix inter with the verb to be, we have a new verb, interbe. If we look into this sheet of paper even more deeply, we can see the sunshine in it. Without sunshine, the forest cannot grow. In fact, nothing can grow without sunshine. And so we know that the sunshine is also in this sheet of paper. The paper and the sunshine inter are. And if we continue to look, we can see the logger who cut the tree and brought it to the mill to be transformed into paper. And we see wheat. We know that the logger cannot exist without his daily bread. That's also in this sheet of paper. The logger's father and mother are in it too. When we look in this way, we are we see that without all these things, the sheet of paper cannot exist. Looking even more deeply, we can see ourselves in the sheet of paper too. This is not difficult to see because when we look at a sheet of paper, it's part of our perception. Your mind is in here and mine is also. So we can say that everything is in here with this sheet of paper. <laughs> we cannot point out one thing that is not here. Time, Space, the earth, the rain, the minerals in the soil, the sunshine, the cloud, the river, the heat. Everything coexists with this sheet of paper. That is why I think the word interbe should be in the dictionary. To be is to interbe. We cannot just be by ourselves alone. We have to interbe with every other thing. This sheet of paper is because everything else is. Suppose we try to return one of the elements to its source. Suppose we return the sunshine to the sun. Do you think that this sheet of paper would be possible? No, without sunshine, nothing can be. And if we return the logger to his mother, then we have no sheet of paper either. The fact is that this sheet of paper is made up only of non-paper elements. And if we return these non-paper elements to their sources, then there can be no paper at all. Without non-paper elements like mind, logger, sunshine, and so on, there will be no paper. As thin as this sheet of paper is, it contains everything in the universe in it. That makes me wonder. Good morning. I'm Dave Cicero, Director of Lifespan Religious Education here at UUCW. My pronouns are he and his. So normally I've, my role during worship is to tell a story, read a storybook. And uh, I really enjoy connecting what can, to some people, might seem like a child's thing, but uh, many, trust me, many congregants have come to me over the last couple of years since I've been here to share uh, how meaningful it is to them to hear those and the appreciation that they hear, which I welcome and thank, thank you for expressing um, the connection that, that the, they also see between the sermon or the speaker that's here that week and the stories that I choose. So I'm an educator. I'm also an artist. And when we kind of realized, okay, we're having a new member welcome today. So that has traditionally taken the, the place of a story for all ages. So uh, Steve invited me to, 
to speak on the topic here. And I wondered if I was up to that task, but I uh, thank him for doing so. Now, I decided that I wasn't going to do something new. I'd dig into my own experiences. And one of the, one of the things that came to mind initially when this idea of wonder and what is wonder, um, something that came to mind is, is a memory I had from when I was a teacher education student. This was actually in San Jose, California. I took a 45 minute bus ride from where I live down to the university um, several times a week. And one of my professors who was very influential on me had us journal, which I had not really done much of prior to that. So I found oftentimes on this bus ride, it would give me an opportunity to reflect on my last couple days and what's been going on. Well, so picture this, you know, it's kind of a crowded, maybe kind of humid bus, um, jo people jostling, stop and go, stop and go. And sharing this space with strangers. A couple of weeks ago, I read a story where the strangers all, the people on the riders on the bus all seemed to know each other and kind of looked forward to seeing each other every, every Sunday that, in that case. But I never really knew anybody on the bus. Every once in a while, I recognized somebody, but so there's always strangers around. And I remember sitting in by the window and just kind of taking a break from my writing, my thinking. Something might have caught my eye. It was a flock of birds that kind of lit from the ground and started doing its dance in the sky as it moved and morphed and kind of flew away. I've since learned that's called a murmuration. I've learned that here in the last couple of years. Um, and as that murmuration of birds kind of flew off into the distance, across my field of vision came a biplane. I thought, oh, this is odd. This is 1990s, you know, it wasn't like the 1940s or something. Here's a biplane. And, oh, that was just kind of interesting. And as the biplane almost left my field of vision, behind it was a jet stream and a jet kind of taken off. And I guess being the artist that I am, I noticed this visual phenomenon and thought, wow, that's pretty cool, this murmuration of birds taking off from the ground, crossing this biplane, and then followed by a jet. It was this progression that just seemed very meaningful to me. I remember writing it down and wondering what, what that was about. I like to think that I pay attention to things that I notice in my, in my life. Details. Observations. Wondering what those might be about. This is actually something we do in our religious education classes as well. The model that many of our classes are kind of built on we call it spirit play. It's actually a UU version of, a, of something called godly play. And asking wondering questions is a central part of, of that whole teaching experience and learning experience. Wondering can be done verbally. Gee, I, I wonder what that character was thinking. It could be done non-verbally, too gestures that a teacher might give to the students just to inv invite their curiosity. These wondering questions are often not answered. Part of me has always kind of been uncomfortable with that, but I've learned to, to accept that. That just wondering, for the sake of wondering, is sometimes valuable. I'm wondering where I was going to go next with these notes.
So some other interests I have, language. As I, when I was in college, and I, I took Latin in high school. That wasn't a very useful language. But in college, I learned Italian. And when I started teaching in California, I learned Spanish. Something that was really wonderful to me about language was this idea that language is a creative act. And when that was described to me or defined to me, it, it kind of, the, the idea was that the sentence that I'm saying right now, I may never have said before in my entire life, all those years, that we're continually creating and expressing in, through words, ideas. It seems to me that we should run out eventually. But you know, there's, only, there's like a finite number of words in the language. Well, I guess we in, are inventing new words every year. Um, and the same is true with art. These ideas seem to be almost limitless, which is just amazing and wonder-making to me. As an artist, then, I identify with this idea that we have like a left brain and a right brain, and the left brain is the more logical side that says, oh, everything happens for a reason. Everything can be explained. But then the right side is more open to intuition and making connections between things that you might not have realized would, would go together. Kind of going back to that wondering questions uh, that, that we encourage students to ask and to think about in RE classes, religious ed classes. Not everything has to be answered. Yet the language of art, design, can help communicate some ideas. I'm often asked, oh, what were you thinking when you made that um, painting? You made that sculpture, you made that pot. And to be honest, it's like, well, I wasn't thinking much about it. I was just putting things together, looking at the relationships between them, saying, oh, that feels right. And often later, I, think, I don't think I'm alone with this, many artists go back and look at their work later then and say, oh, something's being said there. I'm, I'm gonna give it a title. So this idea that it's not known ahead of time is kind of wonderful to me. Things kind of evolve very creatively like language does. Creating something new, something novel. often coming from some intuitive place, yet paying attention to the relationships. When I was an art teacher, which actually going into art was kind of surprising to my family. I was into math when I went to school. As a younger, you know, elementary, high school, I was into math. And then I discovered art, and people thought, well, that's just weird. That's, that's like left brain, and art is so right brain, but if you get pretty far along into the study of math, however, things get pretty interesting and beautiful. The relationships between things, the way things work together is this amazing, wonderful, like how does that work? How, does, how have humans come up with this system to explain blah, 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 that it all just fits together so well and so beautifully? So I wonder at Things like that. How do things, why do things work together and fit together so well? One of the last things I'm gonna reflect on is the idea that, I know in my own art making, when I've tried to say something important, it falls pretty flat. Try and say, make this grand statement Yet, when, when I kind of dial it back in and create something that shows something very specific, 
it, be, it becomes more universal. I'm reminded of a passage in Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance that I read when I was a younger person the, for the first time. And the protagonist is an English teacher who always has, in his beginning writing classes, has his students write, write an essay. And when he was first starting out, he said, write an essay about anything you want. They were pretty lousy essays, as he says. And he was disappointed, like, because people, well, they had, the, the world was open to them. But these essays were just kind of blah, they, they weren't very interesting. So he got this idea, said, okay, look out the window. Write an essay about something you see out the window. And he found by focusing the writer's attention, maybe to a smaller thing, what those people had to say about it became more individual, more insightful. He started bringing the, he started bringing the focus even closer. The next class, write something about your desk that you're sitting in. Eventually, as I recall, he said, the best essays came when he said, look at your thumbnail. Write an essay about your thumbnail. I can't think of anything smaller than a thumbnail or less significant than a thumbnail. And yet, according to him, students wrote longer, more interesting things. And I've learned that as an artist. The more specific you are, the more universal it becomes, ironically. And I don't quite understand why that is. I've often wondered. Uh, I have a note here. I was gonna, I meant to stop at a couple of things that I had underlined here to uh, point out that some of the Unitarian Universalist principles are kind of uh, reflected in some of the things that I was talking about. Um, I'm just gonna go back and point a couple of those out. That perhaps some things that are beyond our understanding that we wonder about and don't have an answer for, those are still worthy of our attention. As our every person in the world is worthy of our respect. I just lost the other ones. Ah, yes. The idea is that making connections, no matter how insignificant things are, we're all interconnected. We inter-are. This idea that everything in the universe is connected, the central principle, Unitarian Universalism, that many of us value. Also this idea that when you can kind of feel something in your gut, that something is just right and true, that's what we're all striving for, is to discover what's true and right in the world. Going back to the storybooks, I'm gonna wrap up here. One of my favorites growing up was Horton Hears a Who, right? Story about this elephant who swore up and down to everyone around him, I'm hearing something on this little flower, this speck of dust almost. People said, no, you're imagining it. No, there's something here. And to me, that story is about not only paying attention to that little thing because it's important, but also for all the people. Was it who's? Yeah, the who's living on that flower. Trying to, understanding that if they don't make themselves known to Horton's friends, they're going to get trampled. Their world is going to be destroyed. 
So they're trying to get everybody to make some noise. To no avail. More and more people to no avail. Until they find, until they find that one person who hasn't come out to, to make a ruckus. That small person who finally said, Yup! That little thing, that was enough for Horton's friends to say, Oh, I hear it. You're right. What a catastrophe. What catastrophe would have happened had that small insignificant who not done their part? I'm by no means perfect. I'm always working on this, and I don't mean to preach about this, but just ask, asking the questions. This is something that I continue to work on personally myself. Paying attention to the little things. Because they are the big things. And I wonder what joy and contentment we'll find in our lives when we stop to smell and wonder at the roses or the who's in our lives. When the blood is coursing through my veins, it feels like a miracle. When I breathe out pain in again, it feels like a miracle. When spirit sends a sweet refrain, feels like a miracle that I can share a song again feels like a miracle I feel holy I feel good I feel like every spark of creation should I feel the Sing for the concert with Micah Kirsto on November 11th, 2022, knowing that folks will see this before that occasion and after that occasion. But I was thinking about this quote from Carl Sagan that says, if you want to make a really 
exceptional apple pie. First, you have to create the universe. <laughs> and I love that so much. This song is sort of about that. It's about um, finding the miracle, recognizing the miracle in every moment. Um, for this month's Split the Plate, the RE middle schoolers chose Running Rebels. I was introduced to Running Rebels through a gentleman named Andre Lee Ellis. Andre lives near 9th and Ring in Milwaukee's 53206 area. This zip code has the most at-risk kids in the city. Kids my age are dealing daily with poverty and violence on a level that is hard to imagine. Andre started a community garden where young men and boys could learn skills learn how to talk out their problems instead of fight, and even learn good nutrition and mindfulness. Oh. A few years ago, Andre turned the garden over to Running Rebels. Running Rebels guides Milwaukee youth into adulthood through monitoring, or through mentoring, positive programs, and community connection. For more information on Running Rebels, see the Split the Plate article in the weekly e-news. If you are taking part today virtually, please go to the UUCW website Donate tab and select Split the Plate from the menu provided. Or you, can text your, or you can text or mail your donation today using information found here. We, um, we thank you for your generosity to Running Rebels of Milwaukee. We will now gratefully accept your offering. Please stand for our closing and extinguishing of the chalice. <clears throat> the closing I chose is called Remembering That the Universe is Larger by Marjorie Newland Leeming. Remembering that the universe is so much larger than our ability to comprehend, let us go forth from this time together with the resolve to stop trying to reduce the incomprehensible to our own petty expectations, so that wonder, that sense of what is sacred, can find space to open up our minds and illumine our lives. <laughs>